A call for improvement in local innovation capabilities. Police seize a quantity of powerful air guns. And in Moscow, the opposition claims mayoral race results falsified. Hello and a very good evening. The director of the central government's liaison office in Hong Kong warned today that the SAR will go into decline if it doesn't raise its innovation competitiveness. Jiang Xiaoming was speaking at the Bo Ao Youth Forum held here in Hong Kong today. Jenny Lam reports. The Bo Ao Youth Forum is a brainstorming event aimed at generating ideas to improve everything from culture to the environment to the economy. In his opening speech, the director of the central government's liaison office, Jiang Xiaoming, noted that in the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report, Hong Kong's ranking rose two places this year, from ninth to seventh among 148 economies. <laughs> But he pointed out that it's in the area of innovation that Hong Kong is lagging behind. Hong Kong's competitiveness in terms of innovation ranks 23rd. He warned the territory will fall into decline if no progress is made. Young people these days are buried in WhatsApp, Weibo, they shop on Amazon and Taobao and check online for ratings of a restaurant before they eat there, he said. His advice, look up, look further and look into the future. Acting Chief Executive Carrie Lam said creativity and entrepreneurship are social values that Hong Kong takes pride in. The government will soon spend $500 million to set up a social innovation and entrepreneurship development fund to encourage cross-sector cooperation. The Economic Development Commission, meanwhile, is looking into how to expand the city's economic base in order to improve competitiveness. Jenny Lam, TVB News. The 9th Pan Pearl River Delta Regional Cooperation and Development Forum opened in Guiyang today. Faced with growing competition within the region, Vice Premier Wang Yang calls on Hong Kong, Macau and the Pearl River Delta to deepen their cooperation. Here's Jenny Lam again. The annual Pan Pearl River Delta Regional Cooperation Forum is an opportunity for 11 local leaders, that is, provincial governors plus the chief executives of Hong Kong and Macau, to see how to improve the way they work together. Speaking at the high-level forum, Vice Premier Wang Yang listed the up-and-coming and thriving economic regions around the country, all of which, he says, pose increasing competition to the Pearl River Delta. Make progress or risk decline, he warned. The Pearl River Delta needs to speed up its globalization, strengthen the rule of law and break down trade barriers. Chief Executive Leung Chen-Ying suggested that Hong Kong can be what he called the region's chief knowledge officer. More than 1,300 companies, he said, have their Asia-Pacific regional headquarters based in Hong Kong. Such focus of global knowledge and experience, he believes, can provide valuable information for companies in the Pearl River Delta. Hong Kong's talents and international network, he said, enabled the city to adopt a new approach in working with the Pearl River Delta. Jenny Lam. TVB News. Staying on the mainland now, two people have been killed and 17 wounded in an explosion near a school in the resort city of Guilin in Guangxi. Witnesses said a man on a three-wheeled motorcycle was driving past the school gate when his vehicle caught fire and exploded. The driver was one of those killed in the explosion. Officials in Guilin said 10 of those wounded in the blast were students. The rest of the injured were said to be adults accompanying students to school or passers-by. The explosion struck shortly after 7 a.m. as students were arriving at a primary school. Some classrooms were damaged in the explosion and classes have been suspended. Well, inflation on the mainland edged down last month as an economic recovery gathered strength. Government data released today show that consumer prices rose 2.6 percent, down from July's 2.7 percent. Food prices rose 4.7 percent in August, down from the previous month's 5 percent. Slower price rises and improved economic activity could allow the central government to shift its focus from propping up the, the economy to longer-term reforms, including making the country more efficient and productive.
Turning to the United States now, the Obama administration is in the final stages of its push to convince skeptical lawmakers and war-weary Americans that limited airstrikes against Syria are needed for America's long-term safety. As Alan Bugnia reports, it appears to be an uphill battle. With Congress reconvening today and a vote in the Senate set for Wednesday, the Obama administration released videos showing a chemical weapons attack in Syria to bolster its case for military intervention against the Syrian government. Those videos make it clear to people that these are real human beings, real children, parents being affected in ways that are unacceptable to anybody, anywhere, by any standards. Kerry is in Europe trying to raise support for the military action against Syria. In the U.S., there continues to be congressional resistance to an attack. The video doesn't determine uh, whether we should go to war. And I've talked with my constituents, and they are overwhelmingly opposed to going to war. I've been to the classified briefings. I know what the evidence is. And I think the case is, is not that strong right now. This foreign policy expert says the stakes are huge for President Barack Obama, who needs to win the support of both the Senate and the House of Representatives. If he wins in the Senate and loses in the House, he's lost. If he loses a vote on the fundamental question of war and peace, then the next three years of his presidency are going to be very, very difficult. If he wins the vote and carries out the operation, he's got to be able to point to a certain degree of success not the hour after the operation, but a month after the operation, that something has changed for the better, that chemical weapons at a minimum are no longer being used. Opinion polls in the U.S. increasingly show most Americans opposed to military action. I think it's the wrong move. We don't need to police the world. Let them police themselves. We have to get involved. After what they did, and you see on the video those children, what they did with the chemicals. I believe that America is overextended around the world, and I believe that America has sort of overreached its sort of welcome around the world. Alan Bruckner, TVB News. Well, Russia's opposition movement achieved a telling result in Moscow's mayoral election yesterday after its leader, Alexei Navalny, won more than a quarter of the vote. The incumbent mayor, Sergei Sobyanin, gathered 51% of the vote. Navalny immediately disputed the, account, the outcome, saying the results were deliberately falsified. While the result wasn't that surprising, what did get everyone's attention was the share of the vote opposition leader Alexei Navalny picked up compared with Moscow mayor Sergei Sobyanin. In the end, Sobyanin narrowly avoided a runoff after electoral officials reported today he won about 51% of the vote. Navalny, who energized the race into one of the most competitive in a decade, garnered roughly 27 percent, a decent result for the opposition leader. But his team had expected to do well enough to trigger a second round. At least that's what their exit poll data had suggested. The charismatic Navalny later accused Sobyanin of cheating to avoid a second round. I once again call on the Kremlin and on the Moscow mayor's office to stop falsification and enter the second round, which is required after this marvelous first round, said Navalny. Independent observers said things had been smooth, but admitted they couldn't tell if there had been irregularities. The election was closely watched around the world amid concerns over the democratic process in Russia. It was seen as a litmus test on the extent to which opponents of President Vladimir Putin and his allies could thrive in an electoral system seen as compromised by Kremlin critics. The vote also follows Navalny's recent conviction of embezzlement charges in a trial he says was politically motivated and biased against him. Yesterday's mayoral election was the first since 2003. Last year, the Kremlin reversed Putin's 2004 decree, abolishing direct elections for the Moscow mayor and other regional leaders. Fourteen people were hurt when a Thai Airways jet carrying more than 300 people skidded off the runway while landing at Bangkok's main airport late yesterday. The Airbus A330, arriving from Guangzhou, had a malfunction in its wheelbase while landing. Sparks were seen near the right landing gear close to the engine. Most 14 people hurt were injured as the passengers evacuated the plane. The incident occurred less than two weeks after 20 people were hurt 
on a Thai Airbus A380 hit turbulence as it was flying into Hong Kong International Airport. North Korea marked the 65th anniversary of its founding today with a military parade. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un watched as the soldiers marched and bands played in the main square of Pyongyang. Thousands of North Korean soldiers and citizens participated. The event comes amid the easing of tensions on the North Korean of on the Korean Peninsula that followed the North's third nuclear test in February. Subsequent UN sanctions prompted weeks of nuclear threats from Pyongyang. But the North and South have recently resumed talking. Stung by last year's diplomatic failure, Washington now sets a bar high for a resumption of multilateral nuclear talks. It's demanding Pyongyang first take concrete steps to demonstrate its commitment to disarmament. And still ahead in the news. Hong Kong's first electric buses. Estate agents seek public support in opposing market cooling measures. And in Japan, a symbol of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami disaster dismantled. Welcome back. Police have confiscated a batch of modified air guns from five different shops and several private flats. Some of the items are six times more powerful than legally allowed and can cause major injuries. Jenny Lam reports. Police arrested a man from a toy shop in Chen Fu Street in Shengshui, where they found some of the modified air rifles. It is part of a clampdown launched in June, targeting the sale of these items online. The air guns cost between $2,500 and $6,000 each. Police seized a total of 55 of them from five shops in Shengshui, Mong Kok and Shangwan, and from four flats in Chinmun and Tungchung. By law, air guns can only have a muzzle energy of two joules, but that of the modified versions ranged between 5 and 13 joules. That is more than six times than legally allowed and can cause serious injuries. Some air gun retail outlets were also found to be teaching customers how to modify and significantly increase the muzzle velocity of their air guns well beyond the legal limit. Police say the victim of a wounding case in Tinshowai recently was shot with one such air gun at a close range. Apart from the air rifles, police also found 1,500 retractable truncheons worth $1.5 million. Officers arrested five men and three women in the operation, and they have not ruled out further arrests. The maximum penalty for the sale of air guns that are more powerful than allowed by law is 14 years in jail and a fine of $100,000. Jenny Lam. I'm TVB News. Well, Hong Kong's first electric bus service started today. Kowloon Motor Bus will gradually put more of these e-buses on the road over the coming weeks. Rani Samtani has the story. Traveling between Chimsa Choi and Sook Estate on board Kowloon Motor Bus number two got more environmentally friendly today. I think it's uh, rather much silence than the diesel bus. I feel that the bus is a bit slower than conventional ones, but otherwise the difference is not big. Hong Kong's first electric-powered bus can reach a top speed of 70 kilometers per hour and can travel up to 180 kilometers. It takes three hours to charge the batteries, and that's enough for more than 12 runs on the Chimsa Choi to Sook route. Secretary for the Environment Wong Kam Singh hopes the e-bus can help to improve the city's air quality. While buses, uh, the franchise buses, uh, one of the major roadside air polluters in Hong Kong. And the long-term goal is to uh, the zero uh, emission along the roadside. KMB gave a reassurance its new vehicle is safe and wouldn't burst into flames while charging, something which happened to an electric taxi recently. Battery power bus is uh, still a new technology, so we still need to collect a lot of operating data uh, from the front line uh, for us to do detailed analysis. For added safety, KMB has installed special features that will allow bus drivers to monitor the temperature of each battery. And in case of any abnormalities in the bus's system, the electricity supply will automatically shut down. For now, the new e-bus will only be used during the morning and evening rush hours. KMB will review the vehicle's performance in a month's time. Rani Samtani, TVB News. Real estate agents tried to get public support in their bid to relax local property cooling measures. 
They say the measures have affected their businesses, forcing them to cut salaries and other costs. Kurti Nanwadi reports. A moment of silence for the death of the property market. An alliance of local real estate agencies stopped paying advertising fees for one day today in protest at the government's property cooling measures. It also collected signatures from the public urging the government to relax its policies. Real estate agencies say the special measures have had a negative impact on their business, forcing them to cut costs. Now the market, the transaction volume is very low. It's lower than before. So we uh, cut all the uh, expenses, like the, our people sharing, um, our uh, branch. Property agencies also mention they may have to scale back future advertising as a way to cut costs. They also claim the cooling measures are affecting property-related industries, like interior decorators. One property owner thinks the policies are too harsh. I hope the you know, stamp duty will be a bit lower then. For, for all of us, it's better. The alliance also urged the government not to place stamp duties on commercial properties. We don't think the commercial market is affect those Hong Kong people. So why they need to the, add the big double stamp duty? Organizers so far have collected 100,000 public signatures to support the amendment of the stamp duty policy. They will hand it over to the Legislative Council by the end of the month. The alliance says it also has backing of the Liberal Party in its bid to relax the cooling measures. Kirtin Andwani, TVB News. Secretary for the Civil Servants Paul Tang today led a local delegation of 11 government permanent secretaries and department heads on a six-day visit to Beijing and Jiangsu province. The trip will help members of the delegation to better understand the latest developments on the mainland and foster liaison between Hong Kong and mainland officials. Activities will include attending a course at the Chinese Academy of Governance in Beijing. There will also be a briefing by Jiangsu government officials on the latest developments in the province. Residents from the Northeast New Territories want the Advisory Council on the Environment to reject a development project near their homes. They fear for their quality of life as well as the impact of constructions on their surroundings. Vicky Kung reports. Villagers from Kutong and Fanling dressed as animals found near their homes because they're worried the Northeast New Territories development project will spell death for the animals. They staged the protest at Revenue Tower in Wan Chai today, where the Advisory Council on the Environment, or ACE, will decide on the fate of the project. We want the uh, panel today can reject the EIA report and we, we conduct the... the uh, a new one. And also we want to have a reformed EIA system to have a better view of the impact of the development area. Because the whole report is conducted in English and the meeting is also conducted in English. So many of our villagers and also the uh, people in Hong Kong, they don't understand what the uh, EIA report means to us. So we want uh, 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 the whole report should be conducted in Chinese. They want the council to analyze the potential damage on nearby communities and called for more thorough evaluation of the biodiversity and ecological value in the area. But AEC gave the project the green light, even though the area hosts a rare fish species called rose bitterly. These university students sitting behind me could have spent their afternoons elsewhere, but they decided to come to the ACE meeting to show their support to affected villagers. People in there have been living for decades of years, and I just want to, I just want them to continue to live in here and don't just because of a single development project and to sacrifice their original living place. Getting an environmental permit does not mean construction work can begin in the Northeast New Territories. The development project will still have to go through the town planning board. Vicky Kong, TVB News. All right, Tony, how about you for sports? That's right, we've got some exciting news from uh, tennis uh, and another silver medal for Hong Kong in the national games. But let's kick off with the U.S. Open women's final. Serena Williams defeated Victoria Azarenka in three sets to win her fifth U.S. Open title. As Jameson Wong shows us, the American and her Belarusian opponent put on a thrilling display of power tennis. 
After winning the first set 7-5, it looked like clear sailing for the top seed. Victoria Azarenka, though, fought back to take the second in a tiebreaker, showing off her own power game. But Williams was not to be denied her fifth U.S. Open title. The score in the deciding set, 6-1. The American, who turns 32 later this month, became the oldest women's champion at Flushing Meadows. I felt almost disappointed with my year, to be honest. I felt like, um, yeah, I won the French Open, but... I wasn't happy with my performances in the other two slams and, you know, not even making it to the quarterfinals of one. So I uh, definitely feel a lot better with at least a second Grand Slam under my belt this year. With 17 Grand Slam singles titles, Williams moved to within one of Chris Everett and Martina Navratilova for fourth place on the all-time list. Jamison Wong, TVB News. Well, there's more excitement on day two of the America's Cup from San Francisco. New Zealand's Emirates team and Oracle USA split the two races on Sunday. Fog partially shrouded the course, but the 72-foot catamaran still reached speeds of more than 40 knots. Oracle picked up their first win after dropping the opening three races of the yachting showcase. Skipper Jimmy Spittle and his crew need to win 10 of the next 13 races to retain the cup. The United States were docked two points prior to the finals for adding illegal weight to their boats. If New Zealand can finish in front of their rivals six more times, they will clinch the America's Cup. And at the National Games in Liaoning, Hong Kong golfers won a silver medal in the men's team competition. The foursome of Jason Hack, Tang Tzu Hang, Wang Wun Man and Yeung Mo Tin finished second to the host team. Hong Kong placed ahead of the favourites, the Guangdong squad, which featured professional players such as Liang Wen Chong and Jiang Lian Wei. Golf makes a return to the Olympics at the Rio Games in 2016 after a 100-year absence. And finally for tonight, more than two years after Japan's devastating earthquake and tsunami, workers began dismantling a key landmark today, a stranded fishing boat that was swept inland. Early this morning, workers began building an enclosure around the fishing vessel, which rests near the port city of Kisanuma. The vessel's owner, Fukushima Fishing Company, contracted a non-profit organization based out of Hokkaido for the process. The organization said it plans to recycle parts of the ship. The ship has attracted many tourists who come to see one of the few remaining landmarks of the 2011 disaster. And, that, and that's the news for tonight. Thanks for watching. Good night. everyone, it was mainly fine today. At 5 p.m., a subtropical ridge was bringing generally fine weather and fine and hot weather to southern China. Today's temperatures ranged from 26.3 to 31.1 degrees, and the relative humidity was between 65 and 85 percent. The current temperature is 28 degrees Celsius, and the relative humidity is at 78 percent. So, Freddy, what's the weather like tomorrow? Oh. Ah. Mainly fine, hot during the day tomorrow. Temperatures are ranged between 26 and 32 degrees. Tomorrow's API is forecast at 20 to 75 and the pollution level range from low to high. The maximum UV index forecast for tomorrow will be about 11. Now, here's the latest global weather update. Cloudy in Shanghai, Taipei and Xiamen. Sunny in Guangzhou and Macau. Cloudy in Beijing and Tokyo. Rain in Ho Chi Minh City and Manila. Showers in Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta. Sunny in New Delhi and Karachi. Sunny in Cairo, sunny intervals in Nairobi. Showers in Brisbane and Melbourne. Cloudy in Toronto and New York. Sunny intervals in Vancouver and Los Angeles. 
cloudy in London, rain in Amsterdam, showers in Frankfurt and Zurich. And that's the weather. Have a great evening.